はいさーいこんにちは私の名前はミクです Hi it's nice to see you guys Hey my name is Mick and I'm excited to be with you here today for a look at the Battle of Okinawa and I thank Mr. McCord for inviting me to talk to you guys for a little bit today Yeah I was a medic on Okinawa back in the 1970s and 80s and now I live in Montana But I visited the island for a couple of months every year or two for the last several years. I hope that you realize what a great opportunity you have to be on the island at this time in your life. Hey, when I was in middle school, I was in France and have wished over and over again that my dad had been stationed on Okinawa instead. You are indeed fortunate to be there now. Hey, take every advantage of being on such a small island with such a rich history. There's lots to see and lots to learn. Well, you probably know that Okinawa wasn't always a part of Japan. It used to be an independent kingdom, the Ryukyu Kingdom, and over the centuries it has had to put up with a lot of interference from outside powers. Before 1429 there were three different principalities, Hokuzan in the north, Chuzan in the central area, and Nanzan in the south. For many years, the Aji, or the lords, of those principalities were always competing and feuding with each other. But in 1429, Shohashi brought them all together in peace, and the Ryukyu Kingdom was born. Ryukyu enjoyed a lot of profitable trade with China and Korea and Japan, Formosa, which is now Taiwan, and many Southern Asian countries. Japan wanted to get in on some of that action. And in 1609, Shimazu of the Satsuma clan invaded and pretty much took over the kingdom. But they let the Ryukyuns govern themselves and go about their usual activities and sort of stayed in the background, overseeing everything and making them pay tribute to Satsuma. They had to pay so much tribute, like lots of rice, lots of rice, that there was barely enough left over for the Ryukyuns to feed themselves. Meanwhile, Ryukyu was also obligated to pay tribute to China, but that's a complicated topic for another day. Then in 1879, Japan made it official and proclaimed the Ryukyus to be a Japanese prefecture, and they renamed it Okinawa. At that time, Shotai ruled Ryukyu. Shotai was removed from Shuri Castle and was whisked away to Japan. And that was the end of the Ryukyu Kingdom, the kingdom that Shohashi had created in 1429. Then, 450 years later, it was gone. Along came World War II, and the small island was again thrust into turmoil when it became the site of the last ground battle of the war. What makes Okinawa's involvement in the war so sad is that the Okinawans hadn't done anything to start the war. And they hadn't done anything to deserve the beating they took as a result of the war. There were more Okinawans killed than there were Japanese and American military ground forces combined. Many Okinawan civilians escaped death when they were rounded up by American troops and taken care of in special camps. Estimates of up to 150,000 Okinawans, half of the island's civilian population, were killed. As a result of the fighting between the Japanese Imperial Army and the American and British military. Yes, the British. Great Britain had fleet carriers, battleships, cruisers, and destroyers off of Okinawa's shores, but they didn't do any, any、uh, ground fighting. Maybe you've read about the Battle of Okinawa, and maybe you know about what happened with middle school and high school kids, Okinawan kids. In case you don't know, I want to tell you today about the Student Blood and Iron Corps and the Student Nurse Corps, more commonly called the Himiuri Corps or the Lily Corps. In the 1830s, Japan set out upon a campaign to conquer all of East Asia. They invaded, captured, and ruled country after country. By 1941, they got around to taking on the United States Navy at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And that was when the United States figured enough is enough, and they declared war on Japan in order to stop them. Well, little by little, island by island, the U.S. started taking all of those stolen nations away from Japan, and eventually, in preparation to invade the country of Japan itself, Okinawa became a target. 
the Imperial Japanese Army had begun building military facilities all over the island, including many of the outlying islands that are a part of Okinawa Prefecture. The Japanese used Okinawans and captured Koreans as slave laborers, forcing them to dig tunnels, build airfields, and other defensive positions. Meanwhile, they decided that, that they needed to take over the schools, too. So every school had a military officer assigned as an advisor, and before long, by 1944, the military officers pretty much took over the schools. Regular studies were put on hold while students, boys and girls, were indoctrinated, trained in the ways of war. Even the little elementary school kids were trained in drills, marching, and carrying bamboo spears. Children of middle school and high school age were forced into labor digging tunnels and modifying caves. Some caves were used for Japanese army troops and others were used as hospital caves. One such cave is down in Tamagusuku in Nanjo. I made this diagram to show a portion of that cave since it wasn't since I wasn't allowed to take any any photographs in there. Imagine school kids digging tunnels in caves. So, young middle school and high school students were forced to join adult laborers and spent their days digging tunnels with nothing more than pickaxes and shovels. And after long, grueling days of hard labor, they would pass the night trying to catch up on their regular schoolwork. By February of 1945, two months before the Allied invasion of the main island, the Imperial Japanese Army formed the Tiketsu Kinotai, a student blood and iron corps. All schoolboys from age 15 to 19 were forced into military service as runners, cable splicers, you know, if a, if a communication wire cable was damaged from a mortar shell or something, or from bombardment from ships offshore, hey, guess who got, guess who got sent out to repair the cable? Yep, one of the middle school boys, and most of them never came back to their cave. Other jobs were as coders, radio men, you know, lots of different things that they had uh, doing the scut work. While the Himiuri girls were forced into positions such as nursing and very dangerous tasks, securing food and supplies that required them to run through the fields of battle. Toward the end of the battle, when the Japanese had been pushed all the way to the south end of the island, they became very desperate and were losing soldiers by the hundreds every day. Well, to make up for those losses, the students were forced into combat roles, going on night raids, participating in charges, many armed with only a spear against flamethrowers, mortars, and machine guns. The vast majority of those kids never made it out alive. Fortunately for some of the young students, they were captured by U.S. forces and given a chance to live. As the situation became even more desperate, the Imperial Japanese Army lowered the age of conscription to 14. Imagine that, 14 years young and being forced into a war that everyone knew they would never win. Think about that next time you think you're getting too much homework. Those kids would have loved to just go back to school to study, and to even do chores at home. The girls didn't make out any better. They were trained as nursing assistants, but in reality, they did all the scut work. When they were assigned to a hospital cave, they worked by candlelight, holding arms and legs of patients who had amputations without any anesthetic. They had to discard cut off arms and legs, and if there was too much artillery shelling outside of the cave, they would stack the body parts up in the back of the cave. Wounded soldiers had open wounds full of maggots and the girls had to pick them out one by one, sometimes filling a bucket. There's so much more that you can see and learn about the beautiful island that you're living on right now. 
If you'd like to see more about the places that I've mentioned today, you can ask Mr. McCord for a list of my photos and videos. When you get a chance, ask your folks to take you to some of the many places on the island where you can learn much, much more about the Battle of Okinawa. If you have questions for me, please pass them on to Mr. McCord and he'll pass them on to me. I'll do my best to get the answers and he can pass them back on to you. So thank you for your attention and I hope that I've been able to help you understand what Okinawan kids your own age had to deal with during the war. Mata ato de